Hello and thank you all for viewing. Today we're going to discuss gastrointestinal tract volvulus. Here are the learning objectives. Just a quick word about volvulus in general. Symptoms are generally nonspecific, pain, nausea, vomiting, and diagnosis is rarely made on clinical grounds alone, so a radiologic diagnosis is essential. Prolonged volvulus anywhere in the gastrointestinal tract will lead to ischemia and infarction if left untreated and can affect the stomach, the small bowel, and the colon. Starting with gastric volvulus, urconoaxial volvulus where the stomach is rotated along its long axis is much more common than mesenteraxial volvulus where the stomach is rotated along the short axis. Organoaxial volvulus usually occurs in the setting of a large parasophageal hernia or trauma in adults, while boxelic hernia is a risk factor in children. Many times we see the organoaxial appearance of the stomach without clinical or imaging evidence of ischemia or outlet obstruction. Comparison with priors and clinical correlation is very helpful in these cases, as they may best be described as organoaxial positioning rather than a true volvulus though these patients are at risk for future volvulus. A discussion with the clinician, prior studies, and if needed, an upper GI study can be helpful to sort these cases out. Here we see pneumatosis in the gastric wall indicative of ischemia, a distended stomach. We see the gastroduodenal junction is herniated, contributing to the gastric outlet obstruction. And we see a small amount of air in an adjacent leftover quadrant draining gastric vein. So this is a case of organoaxial gastric volvulus complicated by ischemia and outlet obstruction. Here is the cine clip. We see the distended stomach with an air fluid level, gastric wall pneumatosis, and air in the draining gastric veins. Here the coronal images show the extent of gastric dilatation and gastric wall pneumatosis. Also note again how the gastroduodenal junction is herniating, causing the gastric gallet obstruction. Here's the coronal cine clip. Here you more easily see the reversed or upside down orientation of the stomach with the greater curvature above the lesser curvature which is typically how the organoaxial gastric volvulus is described. Next case is also gastric volvulus, this time along the stomach's short axis called a mesenteraxial volvulus. Here we see the gastroesophageal junction and the gastroduodenal junction, which are very close together and you see swirling at the root of the mesentery. This is a pediatric patient, and you see the stomach is significantly descended with fluid, and there's no hiatal hernia. The coronal cine views show the extent, again, of the gastric dilatation and the relationship of the relevant anatomy. Here the stomach is obstructed, but there's no evidence of ischemia. Now we'll move on to the small bowel. Since malrotation is the major predisposing factor for midgut volvulus, I wanted to review those findings. So here's a classic example of bowel malrotation seen incidentally on an adult patient on CT. Note the SMA SMV reversal where the larger caliber SMV is now to the left of the smaller caliber SMA. I want to encourage everyone to specifically follow the stomach and duodenal C-sweep on all patients. And here we see that the duodenum never crosses the midline. Note also that the ileocecal valve is in the left lower quadrant. If you're specifically looking for the appendix on everyone, which you should be doing, and can't find the cecum in the right lower quadrant, this can be the first tip off for bowel malrotation and should prompt closer scrutiny of the duodenum. It's important to note this anatomy on everyone because although malrotation is congenital, volvulus can occur into adulthood if not corrected. 
Here is the cine loop again showing the abnormal SMA to SMV relationship, abnormal duodenum clustered in the right upper quadrant, and the ileocecal valve in the left lower quadrant. So while there is abnormal bowel positioning here, there is no bowel obstruction or mesenteric twist to suggest volvulus. This appearance is typical of what's sometimes called non-rotation, which is a subtype of malrotation with a lower risk of volvulus. It's typically where the large bowel is on the left side of the abdomen and the small bowel is on the right side of the abdomen. The other thing to consider with this appearance is the postoperative positioning of a previously corrected bowel malrotation. The bowel is never put back to the way it normally should look, and rather it's positioned where the colon is on the left side of the abdomen and the small bowel is on the right side of the abdomen. So because of the high stakes here, I routinely call these into the emergency physician just to make them aware of the possibilities, see if they did have a history of a corrected bowel rotation, and make them aware of the potential complications. Next case is a congenital malrotation complicated by midgut volvulus. Note the swirling of the SMA and SMV around each other, and also the swirling of the duodenum and jejunum around each other in the right upper quadrant. Here's a short cine loop again focusing on that right upper quadrant where we see the duodenum and jejunum twisting around each other, compatible with malrotation and complicated by midgut volvulus. Moving on to the large bowel. Here I point out the normal stomach, which is helpfully opacified with orally ingested contrast, just to highlight how one might confuse the dilated and abnormally positioned cecum for a physiologically distended and normally positioned stomach. Adjacent to the stomach, we see the cecum, which is displaced into the left upper quadrant, dilated with an air fluid level. A little bit further down, we see the characteristic twist in the right lower quadrant to confirm a sequel volvulus. Sequel volvulus accounts for 25 to 40 percent of colonic volvulus, and there is usually a congenitally mobile cecum. Other predisposing factors include things that dilate the right colon, like pregnancy or recent colonoscopy. Here with the cine loop, we see the stomach, again, be distended and abnormally positioned cecum. And finally, the mesenteric twist to confirm a sequel volvulus. Here is the coronal series. Major differential consideration here is a sequel bascule, where the cecum is folded on itself, but there's no actual mesenteric twisting. Colonic volvulus can occur anywhere, so we're moving on to the transverse colon. Here we see the dilated transverse colon with an air fluid level, the decompressed splenic flexure, and the twist of the mesentery, this time in the central abdomen, compatible with the transverse colon volvulus. Although it's the rarest site of colonic volvulus, accounting for less than 5 to 10% of cases, it is associated with the highest mortality. Unlike cecal and sigmoid colon volvulus, there's not a classic film appearance for this, so the CT is usually your one and only chance to diagnose it. Here's the cine loop again, starting with the collapsed splenic flexure and the dilated more proximal transverse colon with the mesenteric twist compatible with transverse colon volvulus. Coronal view again just highlighting how helpful they are to piece together the anatomy and clearly showing the twist of the mesentery at the large bowel transition point.
Moving on to the splenic flexure. Again, we see the dilated transverse colon, the twist of the mesentery now in the left upper quadrant, compatible with splenic flexure, volvulus. Axial series again shows the dilated transverse colon with a swirling pattern in the left upper quadrant, compatible with large bowel obstruction, secondary to splenic flexure volvulus. Lastly, we have sigmoid colon volvulus. Sigmoid colon volvulus is the most common colonic volvulus, making up 60 to 75% of cases. Risk factors are chronic constipation, high fiber diet, pregnancy, or hospitalization. Anecdotally, I've seen cases in younger patients associated with chronic opioid use or abuse as the underlying cause of constipation. Here we see the dilated sigmoid colon and the twisting of the mesocolon indicative of a sigmoid colon volvulus. In case of sigmoid volvulus specifically, but also colon volvulus more generally, a repeat study with rectal contrast or a water soluble enema can be performed in equivocal cases to confirm. Here's the axial cine clip, which we'll go through quickly. Just pay attention to how subtle the mesenteric twist can be when evaluated in a single plane. There it is, highlighted in green. Pretty subtle, only on a few slices. Again, I just want to stress how important the reformatted images are. So let's compare that with the coronal views, which more clearly show the twist of the sigmoid mesocolon. Classic appearance of sigmoid volvulus on CT. So again, to review. Volvulus anywhere along the gastrointestinal tract is an emergency, and a zillion diagnosis can have catastrophic consequences like bowel ischemia and infarction. Clinical symptoms are vague and nonspecific. Remember to use all the planes you have to evaluate the GI tract on CT and run the duodenal C-sweep on everyone. Correlation with symptoms and prior studies can be very helpful to help differentiate a chronic organoaxial positioning of the stomach versus an acute organoaxial gastric volvulus, especially in the setting of a large hiatal hernia. Malrotation and mid volvulus are not synonymous. Bowel malrotation describes the underlying congenital anomaly that predisposes one to the acute complication of mid volvulus. Although most patients present in early childhood, mid volvulus can occur at any age and into adulthood. Malrotation, whenever you find it, should always be reported. Regarding volvulus, on equivocal cases, a repeat CT with PO or rectal contrast, depending on the area of the GI tract one is evaluating, or a fluoroscopic study can be performed, but many times the diagnosis can be made on the initial CT. Thank you all for watching.